Okay, hello and welcome everyone. We have just a little bit of a late start, but that just means it's going to be just that much more rich and fulfilling and wonderful and all of the things. Um, we're excited to see 24 people in the room. Go ahead and put in the chat. Let us know where are you uh, joining us from? What state? What's your role? We'd love to see it and say hello to you. I'm very excited uh, to introduce this session, Tribal and Grassroots Community-Based Organizations Partnering with Schools to Improve Youth Outcomes. We have a fantastic and phenomenal lineup of speakers and panelists. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Shira in just a second. We wanna again remind folks to make sure you're leaving questions in the Q&A and that you're leaving comments in the session chat and not the event feed, okay? We wanna make sure that we see all of your questions and your comments and we see you from all over the United States. That's awesome. Uh, and tribal territories and area, in territories and area and tribal um, communities. So we're excited to see you all here and I'm gonna pass the mic over to Shira. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, we are certainly excited to be um, joining you all today. We do have a presentation that we like to share. Um, so if you would uh, bear with me, I will get our presentation uh, pulled up. And again, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depends on where you're joining us from. Um, but we just wanna thank you so much for joining the session uh, on this important topic. So today's session is tribal and grassroots community-based organizations partnering with schools to improve youth outcomes. Um, again, my name is Shira Murray and I serve as the program officer at the Center at Sierra Health Foundation located in um, California and I work with the Elevate Youth California program. Um, but before we dive into the presentation, we just wanna take a moment to appreciate the collective commitment of everyone here. Your presence reflects a shared dedication to creating a positive impact in the lives of young individuals. So we appreciate you for that. And today we have the privilege of hearing from three remarkable panelists, our four um, remarkable panelists who are not only advocates for change, but also Elevate Youth California. California funded partners dedicated to improving the lives of young people. So their commitment to community, youth empowerment, equity, collaboration, and reimagining the way that we approach systems of care, healing, and well-being will be seen in this presentation. And we hope that you will leave informed, inspired, and encouraged to explore new ways to empower and support young people in your own practice. Um, today, we have uh, several individuals joining us. Um, we have Stephanie List, and Stephanie is the unit chief at the California Department of Healthcare Services. Stephanie has nearly five years of experience with substance use prevention, working at the Department of Healthcare Services, DHCS. So currently, Ms. List leads uh, the Proposition 64 program unit within the prevention and youth branch at DS, excuse me, DHCS. Uh, which is charged with dispersing the California cannabis tax funds that are deposited in the youth education, prevention, early intervention, and treatment account. So we are excited uh, to have Stephanie uh, join us on today. We also have Natalie Zapata. Natalie's background in program and curriculum development and passion for creating a better future drives her relentless efforts in advocating for justice and positive change, um, highlighting values of empowerment, critical thinking, compassion, and creativity. She utilizes her skills to organize multi-generational groups to address key social justice issues, including mental health advocacy, promoting relevant education, empowering BIPOC communities, advancing LGBTQIA plus rights, and systemic challenges of poverty. So Natalie joins us um, from Auburn Hip Hop Congress. Also, we have a Victor Hugo uh, Maroquin, and Victor is a first-generation queer Chicano Ch uh, Chapin scholar and activist from East Hollywood, Tonga land, who serves as queer and trans youth of color um, and the respective communities. Um, Victor serves as the Youth Justice Coordinator at REACH LA. So we are excited to hear from Victor and to learn about the work happening at REACH LA. And also we have two individuals from the Native Dads Network. So we have Michael Duncan. Michael Duncan is enrolled 
a member of the Round Valley uh, Indian tribes. His tribal heritage is Maidu, Wakai, and Wintun, and Western Band Shishore. In 2012, Mike Duncan founded Native Dads Network and is currently the CEO, doing awesome work um, in California. And also joining Michael is Patricia Titman. Um, Patricia um, is a mom to two, a student, a traditional dancer, and a community pillar. So she recently graduated from uh, Sacramento City College, has an associate's in nutrition, and hopes to pursue a degree in medicine, has a passion for working with tribal communities and helping to create paths of wellness. So we are really um, excited to have each of our panelists here with us today um, to be sharing about their programs and the works that they are doing. At this uh, time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Stephanie to share more about um, Elevate Youth California, as well as the funding structure for the program. Thank you, Shira. As she mentioned, I am the unit chief over the Prop 64 program unit at DHCS um, in partnership with Sierra Health Foundation or the center. My team assists in implementing the Elevate Youth California program. There is absolutely no way that we could do this work without our value partners at the center. Um, so we really appreciate their partnership. This kind of gives you an overview. Uh, Elevate Youth California is a project of the center. It's a health foundation under contract with DHCS. And um, these funds are coming from tax allocation three and it's youth education, prevention, early intervention and treatment account, also known as the YAPETA. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? And this goes over an overview of the Proposition 64 Advisory Group. So the Prop 64 Advisory Group is a requirement under the Prop 64 Revenue and Taxation Code and was initially formed in 2017. Uh, the intent of this group is to guide the development, implementation, and evaluation of projects funded by the YAPETA Fund. The advisory group is comprised of volunteer health organizations, physicians who treat addiction, researchers, family therapy and counseling providers, and education professionals with expertise in public health and substance use. Um, next slide, please. And this gives you a good breakdown of kind of how the YAPETA funds work. So when we receive the YAPETA funds, 12 million is provided annually to the California Department of Public Health. They carry out data and surveillance activities. 75% uh, of the YAPETA account is allocated to California Department of Social Services. So this is utilized to provide childcare vouchers to under-resourced and underserved communities. 5% um, of the APETA account goes to California Natural Resources Agency to support their youth community access program. The intent of that program is to support youth access to natural or cultural resources with an emphasis on serving communities impacted by the war on drugs. And then finally, my favorite one is a 20% of your PETA account is allocated via a contract with the center. These funds are used to implement the ever-growing Elevate Youth California program. And I'll pass it back over to Shira. Thank you. Um, I'll also share a little bit about this year Health Foundation um, the center. Um, just want to share that the center uh, is a managing entity of Elevate Youth California. Uh, the center was launched in 2012 and brings people, ideas, and infrastructure together to create positive change in California and is dedicated to health and racial equity. Um, as you can see on the screen, this is the Elevate Youth California program mission and vision. So Elevate Youth California is a statewide program addressing substance use disorder by investing in youth leadership and civic engagement for youth of color and to us LGBT plus youth ages 12 to 26 living in communities uh, disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. It's our goal and mission that all youth um, have access and are um, equipped with tools to be successful. Here is a snapshot of um, the program reach. You can see the number of grant awards that have been allocated since the program's inception, where programs are allocated, and uh, the dollars that have been awarded. So we uh, hope that this map um, shares a little bit of grasp of how large the program is and also uh, its reach in the state of California. Now, without further ado, we will hop into our funded partner presentations and we're going to have our uh, Native Dads Network um, take over from here.
Okay, let's see. Um, we're going to have Michael and Patricia, if you can come off mute. Okay, and once you uh, come off mute, you can um, begin your presentation. Oops, they were off mute for a second and then I think it went back on you. There okay. you go. There you go. All right, here we go. Third time. Third <laughs> time's a charm. Um, again, my name is Michael Duncan. I'm the executive director of Native Dads Network, and I'm really happy to be here today to present on impact um, with Patricia, you know, our, our program, uh, lead program is a uh, program coordinator of Native Dads Network. And um, she's going to share a little bit about our programming that we've been doing here in the last year and a half, two years. Um, next slide, please. Now, this um, next this program really began for us, you know. Um, and I'm really happy to start. Really, it's our first cohort for us, you know, first round of funding. And um, we took this project and we started looking at needs inside tribal communities. At the right at the beginning of this uh, program, we started looking at um, the youth and doing listening sessions and started understanding and just having the impact of. We started interesting the impact of cannabis with inside our communities, uh, tribal communities with our tribal youth. And so we started taking a deeper look at that. And, and next slide, please. Um, we started looking at the marketing. We started looking at the, the rates of substance abuse use in our, in our tribal communities. We started looking at the uh, long, uh, the marketing tactics that we're using by cannabis, um, uh, you know, uh, dispensaries and so forth. Um, and we started looking at how it was created to really, really in our youth and, and the substance abuse problem that we're having with our youth at this time. And so that's how the impact started. And so when we started looking at the, uh, the so impact is actually uh, an acronym and it stands for Indigenous Mentors Protecting Ancestral Cultural Teachings Team. And it was developed to help the youth to give them the correct knowledge and, and, and uh, about traditions and culture and how um, sometimes with these uh, marketing tactics, it kind of goes into um, teaching that this is part of our culture and we would we really want to put an end to that with, with correct teachings. And so that's how it really began. Um, next slide, please. And as you see, this is some examples of how that was kind of what we were noticing with alcohol, how alcohol was doing, you know, and looking at other tactics by the alcohol and tobacco. Next slide. Uh, marketing tactics they were using and they're using similar um, tactics today with the cannabis next slide please so after we, we really started establish that we got a good cohort of youth and we started working we started saying we started working inside um we started uh, addressing this with inside the school district said hey would you like to do a presentation um and that opened all type of different doors we started realizing, looking at our big map, that there was a lot of um, communities that didn't have uh, Indian education programs. They didn't have a parent committee. Um, so there was a lot of uh, needs that were lacking in all these districts. So our first district we worked in, um, because um, I was I live in Yellow County, I would, uh, my kids were going to Woodland Unified School District uh, at Woodland High, and we, we started addressing that district first and talking about, um, you know, addressing Again, some uh, cultural appropriateness trainings for the educators, uh, and we started forming our youth group there. Um, we went from that from that uh, district, and we started branching out, and we went to Twin Rivers, uh, which Albert was a you know he's a, was a part of that parent committee out there, and working in that area. And Albert's our deputy director of our uh, Native Dads Network. He's going to be here today, so I'm filling in. And so he started. He was already working in that district. And we started working with that district. Um, and doing some of the projects that you see listed here. Um, and all these things are going on simultaneously. And, and, and we started doing, um, we started working on murals and I'm just gonna share a little bit about that here in a few seconds. Um, and then we reached out to, and currently are working in uh, Folsom Cordova Unified School District and working with those parent, that parent committee as well, uh, trying to form a, a youth program, a impact youth program there, as long as a parent committee to uh, work with the students and the district to um, address some of the things that they need in that district as well. So this program, it's just a lot of it's not a lot of time. We're, we're doing a lot of work. I think what's what's great about this is that you know this is our like this is our first round of funding, 
And when we look at, um, and if you're really beginning this this work, you'll start to look at it and say, man, this is maybe you got to get stuck somewhere. But um, you know, my advice is just to continue going, find the needs with inside the district, and really address those districts one one thing at a time by prioritizing that list. I'll slide it over to next slide, and I'll slide it over to Patricia because uh, I know we only have a few minutes. Yeah, um, thank you, Mike, for that really great introduction. Uh, my name is Patricia Tipman. I'm the Senior Program Specialist and Executive Assistant here at Native Dads Network. Um, and similar to what Mike was saying, um, a lot of the work that we have done in the community initially started with addressing um, cannabis and the um, advertising um, that they were doing to, you know, giving to our youth. And so we were noticing billboards that were, you know, in areas that were highly populated by tribal communities and um, those billboards are also representing some of our traditional uh, regalias. As you can see in the pictures, um, you know, we wear uh, these traditional regalia, like when we're dancing or practicing, practicing ceremony. And so we noticed, hey, they're using our, our culture as a form of advertising to make it seem safe to the kids. Mm -hmm. So how can we stop that? And so um, that's when impact was created. And the goal was really to just create alternative marketing, marketing solutions um, and educate Native youth and tribes on, and those who work with Native youth on the long-term effects and impacts of cannabis on the brain um, and on the life. And so, um, you know, impact is what we call our little baby here. And um, through the work in the school districts, um, Mike and Albert really led uh, the initiative there um, in Woodland. This is our Woodland mural that we painted with our youth. Um, and so we have a coalition of about 15 youth on this project. Um, and we were able to paint this mural with the help of um, an organization called Hope Through Art. Um, and this represents, we say, um, the traditional people of that area. And so um, in that area, we have like what we call Putwin people, and that's Mike's um, tribe. And so over the course of five weeks, we hosted workshops and we had about 12 to 15 youth um, participating in these workshops where we educated them on issues facing tribal communities, such as MMIW, um, the land back movement. Um, and then also we talked about cannabis and how marketing strategies um, are being used to um, infiltrate the minds of our youth, what we say. And so um, this mural is uh, was the first way that we were able to um, create a systems change within the school district. We fought hard, and really I say we, but Mike. Mike put a lot of work into um, <clears throat> forcing the school district to recognize that Native people are still here we're in large numbers, um, and through the through Mike's efforts, he was able to um, you know get the Native American Resource Center in Woodland, and we also have a resource library over there. And then we painted this beautiful mural, and this mural um, really represents the Putwin culture, the ceremonial practices, um, and it gives voice to our youth. If you can go to the next slide, <clears throat> and so similar to our work um, in Woodland, um, sorry, go ahead. We also did the same thing in Twin Rivers, but before we move on, I wanted to show the video of that mural project. Okay. And then you're ready to do the rock and roll. Okay. My name is Unique Weathington. My name is Journey. Cesario Duncan. Kenai Clough. My name is Michael Duncan. I'm the executive director of Native Dads Network. I'm Shane Grammer. My nonprofit is Hope Through Art Foundation. My name is Annalisa Ramos. It's Joseph White. Olivia. My name is Alina. My name is Maya. My name is Love Duncan. I'm Concal Aliki Winton and Western Manchester from Round Valley Indian Reservation. My tribes are Yurok and Tolawa. Mia Bay, Washington, we're the Macaw Nation. Homo tribe. I'm Kyle Wailaki Wintun from Round Valley and Western Massachusetts from the Bay. Shoshone. Um, Monorentria. The Yaki Indians. Yaki and Chichimeca in Mexico. The Round Valley Indian tribes. I'm Waidu, Wintun, Wailaki on my father's side, and I'm Western Massachusetts and Tomok on my mother's side. What does MMIW mean? It means Missing and Murdered Indigenous Woman. 
it almost kind of like how news spreads awareness about stories. That's what we're trying to do with this mural. I wanted to be a part of something that I thought was bigger than me and that would impact a lot of people. Growing up before I met Love, I thought I was like the only Native American in my school. I've gotten bullied for having long hair. That was the time that I made the decision of cutting my hair because I was like, you know what, I keep getting made fun of. I regret it now, but... I got picked on for just having long hair, and my dad told me I should be proud of my long hair and proud of who I am as a person, as a Native. When I came home from the second day, I started drawing and then I started making song lyrics. So I feel like this like motivated me to like do things I like. Within the day, the second day, our leadership will see leaders that arise, youth that will take initiative. It was really fun, like going up there, doing like precise lines. I just like the colors and the details of how everybody's day is such it. And I like the, the message overall. My favorite part of the mural has to be the red dress representing MMIW. The work is just beginning. This is a beautiful, this is a beautiful time for Woodland and for Native Jazz Network and the school district and our partnership. And we're really pleased with the work so far. My favorite part of the mural is just meeting new people and getting to have this opportunity. We get to put something important into this town. It's living proof that, hey, we're still here. We're gonna be here forever. We're gonna be loud and proud of that. This is our land. What is the meaning of being Native American to me is celebrating your culture because at one point we weren't allowed to. Thank you, Shira. Um, so yeah, and I just wanted to touch on, you know, we were kind of short on time, but, um, you know, just like this project, we also did that um, two other times. We did Twin Rivers Unified School District was another district that Albert um, got to lead the project on that um, on that one. And our youth, you could see a picture of our youth here. Um, you know, they're amazing, they rocked it. You know, this mural was really, really hot and it was, you know, 102 degree weather and we're standing on, you know, the concrete and they still managed to pull together um, a massive, massive mural. It was about 140 feet long um, and about 10 feet tall and 15 youth um, painted that mural in four days actually on this one. Um, and so it was amazing just to see that work. And so recently we just completed one last month or month before last in March um, at what is now named Newark Middle School and was previously named uh, Sutter middle school and so it's a huge honor that our youth got to paint that mural to represent and you can go to the next slide as well Shira. um so this is the most recent mural that we just painted and this represents um something um bigger than us but we had got to um really got to honor the name change and the traditional people of this land um, and so we felt grateful that our youth got to paint that to really signify um, the system that you know the systems change we're changing school names and we're bringing back recognition to tribal people um, and so uh, that wall used to say Sutter Miners and, and now it represents the Mule of Kanishinan people. It, you know, thank you guys so much. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything. Just one last thing that a lot of these kids, it's there's, and then the mural that came from the second, from the first mural to the yeah. third mural. So there's repeat, you know, the kids continue to come back, mm -hmm. be part of our classes and they enjoy their time. And we look forward to more work going in the future. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Patricia. So glad that uh, you, you are here to share about the awesome work that you all are doing and um, seeing in the comment, just a beautiful, beautiful video and beautiful work that you all are doing. At this time, we're gonna go ahead and pass it over to Victor from Reach LA.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Shara. And thank you so much um, to all the amazing peers at Native Dance Network for doing amazing work. As was mentioned earlier, my name is Victor or Victor. Pronouns are he, they, and a, a. Anything is cool with me. And I'm from East Hollywood, Koreatown, but we are on the land of the Tongva, Fernandengo, Korea, um, and Fernandengo peoples. And so to everyone joining us, thank you so much. Buenos dias or buenas tardes, because I see some of y'all are like from New York, Cincinnati, North Dakota. So like, Y'all are in the future, but I just think that wherever we are, it's very important for us to recognize the original and current caretakers of the land, water, and air. And so I am from Reach A, and so Reach LA, we are an LGBTQ organization that is here to engage and empower young LGBTQ plus people of color and the respective communities. And so we operate on four pillars of health and wellness, personal development, social enterprise, and creative arts. And for those of you who have never heard of our organization, something that's really important to know about our history is that we got started in 1992, which was the time of the LA uprising, or as how many of y'all may know it, um, the LA riots. And so when Reach LA got started in the early 90s, we specifically are in a part of downtown LA that is gay neutral territory. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Los Angeles landscape, is that like this part of um, downtown LA that Reach LA is in, it's just like, it's kind of, it's the party district where everyone comes and buys their piñatas, it's the flower district, the fashion district, but we're in between like the historically black corridors of South Central. And then we're just a little bit over the bridge in Boa Heights, East LA, which is like predominantly Latina, Mexican. And so especially during the nineties, there was a lot of racial tensions between black and brown people specifically. And so Breach LA was strategically created by four women artists in our community to be a safe haven as a place for like one, our community, um, our youth will be able to like have access to like sexual health resources, but they can be come together here for like artistic development. So something really dope about our organization is that we actually have weekly programming. So as you can see, like the four pictures and like the five of us, so like for one, we have like Vogue one on one. So like that's just like a little bit of like hand performance. We have a gamer night, hip hop, um, we have hip hop classes, that stretch classes. We also have um, a heels class. And we also have the fundamentals of bundling. Something is that we work really heavily with the ballroom house community. And so all our classes are free. And so we're really happy at Rich that we're able to provide that kind of accessibility. We're a staff of three people and we do. Um, and I think that in talking about the staff of like 30 people, can I, we actually move on to the next slide, please? And so specifically, this is our team within like the EYC. So it's myself. It is Jay Dali and it is Jay who also serve as youth engagement specialist. So while we are like a small team, we're like, we get to do amazing work. And can we please uh, move on to the next slide as well, please? I just wanted to recognize my other team members. But something like really big about Reach LA is like, as I mentioned, we do have like a health and wellness pillar. So a big part of that is because like, we have to achieve to like make sure that um, queer and trans youth and then overall just youth of color in LA have access to low to no cost medical and mental health services. So actually here at Reach LA, what we do is that we actually offer free HIV testing Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. And then on Mondays and Wednesdays, we actually are able to provide treatment for any um, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, we are actually able to also link any of our clients, anybody who comes in to prep or pep. For those of you who aren't familiar with that is, um, basically it has a kind of long name, it's pre-exposure prophylaxis. But basically think of prep as like, a, it's like a birth control pill, but for HIV. And so we also have free therapy as well. Anybody who signs up will actually be able to have 10 free therapy sessions to any of our services here. And all our licensed clinicians are all also identifying as queer and trans people of color. And so I know that like we're, this is like a mental health conference. Like all are probably like wondering, oh, like, so like what does sexual health have to do with this? But like the reality is like, especially too with like queer and trans youth of colors that like we are disproportionately impacted by self-harm, by substance misuse, by addiction, by overdose. And of course, as we know, it's not because of who we are there's a lot of contributing factors that go into this but it's all interconnected we cannot be able to address the emotional and mental health of our communities while also not um, addressing the sexual health disparities and can we please move on to the next slide 
And just to ground ourselves, y'all, like on some data, and thank you so much, Shira, for being able to move the slides, is that like, as I was saying, it's just like queer and trans youth are impacted by high rates of depression, by self-harm, by substance use. And as we see that this is also highly racialized. We see that those numbers are higher for youth who are Black, Latinx, Indigenous, or if they're mixed or more than one race or ethnicity. And so for us, it's very important that like, when we're kind of like providing these services to our community, especially, and I can say this to myself um, as someone who like is a young queer and trans person of color, but I myself started up as a client at Reach LA and everyone on my team actually started up as a client at Reach LA as well. So I feel like a lot of us have like a special connection and like we have like a different kind of heart when it comes to the work in the sense that like we know the importance of the impact and we've all had experiences in which like, for example, like um, I can share with everybody here that as a young person, when I first started trying to access like sexual health, like sexual health services, getting tested for HIV or trying to get tested for any STIs, like you just felt really judged. Like people like there's like a lot of invasive questions are asked about like your sexual orientation. And on top of that, it's like already kind of hard being a person of color trying to access like clinical services because like, you know, people have their own misperceptions just because, like, they may be an expert in their field of medicine or in their field. Like, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have trauma-informed care to know what it's looked like to, like, be able to work with our community. And if we can please move on to the next slide. And this is just some data to illuminate, like, just even my own personal experiences that I share with many peers like my own is that there's so many disparities when it comes to accessing healthcare. As y'all can see, like, on the data on the right, there are um, LGBT, this is, it says LGBTQ youth who did not feel cared for by providers who understand their culture by race or ethnicity. And the one on the left is like um, the access to healthcare among LGBTQ youth last year in 2023. And as y'all can see, 56%, that's more than half of queer and trans youth did want care and didn't, and, um, but didn't receive it. And those of them who did, we oftentimes feel it's just like, okay, well, Am I giving the proper care to like understand what I'm going through? Or if I come here and get access to these services, will I feel judged? Will I feel, will I feel respected? And that's such a big thing because like, I feel like that's also what turns away so many young people in our community to also never want to access these services again. So thankfully, you know, so much with like the funding that we're able to get with EYC, very, very similarly to like Native Dads Network, like we are also the first time being able to do this like year in partnership because Reach LA, our youth population in general as an organization, we service anybody who are the ages from 13 to 35. But EYC now allows us to like now focus more formally with schools and like community partners and clubs to like be able to do more of that policy and advocacy work because as an LGBTQ organization or just like in general, anybody who works with queer and trans people, y'all know that like a lot of times like this kind of population, we don't get to access them until a little later because they don't necessarily feel faith being themselves in schools and like their livelihoods can be at risk at home so there's just so many factors that go into fact as to like why are we kind of like extend our services to like older quote unquote older populations um but i only bring that up just because even now that we're doing like work with the schools and the organization community more formally like we're the type of organization that's like even myself as a staff member like one day i'm here like i'm doing a, a LGBTQ safety and empowerment um, training for parents. Um, one day I get to be working with like elected officials. And then the next day I'm at the club, you know, at a gay club because like we're actually handing out HIV testing kids. And I think a lot of like Bambi Salcedo, who is a director of Trans Latina Coalition here in Los Angeles, and she says like, as like, you know, we have to meet our community at every single level. And we have to make sure that we're accessible, whether it be in schools, clubs, community events. So it's just very important for us to ground ourselves in that work and just having that trauma-informed care framework as well. And can we please move on to the next slide, Sharon? And so I want to recognize our former programs manager at Reach LA, Celestial Moreno Luz. And uh, even something personal with me and her, like Celestial is actually like my, my gay mom. For those of you who don't know, like, um, or have ever heard, like, Within LGBT communities, we we have chosen family, um, especially when sometimes maybe our biological family can show up for ways, um, in ways because they, they haven't had the opportunity to learn yet. And so Celestial, I want to recognize because she's actually the one who I, I'm actually applied 
for the EYC funding and what she envisioned for this um our youth development and like our policy and advocacy work with something called Behold Our Legacy. It's just like very much like kind of being able to provide the history to our youth on how they're now expanding on transcestors and queer elders before them who sacrificed who so they can be here. You know, Pride Month is coming up and I feel like something that comes a lot for me, like that comes up for me a lot during this time is like how performative it can get. And how oftentimes, like, you know, we're throwing the rainbow capitalism, but, like, we don't talk about the history, right, where, like, especially us that, like, does HIV prevention work, so many queer and trans people before us died um, for that we could, we can have the the right to exist and the right to live, and so I just want to just recognize in general trans women of color in our community because they're the ones who really laid down the foundation for us to, to be able to continue the work. Um, and But just to bring it back specifically to, not, like, the work that we get to do with EYC, is that our youth, for example, here in California, we have something called CHIA. And I'm going to put it in the chat for y'all. It's like, this is like the acronym, and I'm not going to be able to like elaborate, but it's the California Health, um, the California Health Youth Act. And so basically under this act here in California, California schools actually legally have to teach inclusive sexual health education, which includes like accesses to like PrEP, HIV prevention, STI screenings, um, and then also any kind of birth control. Do schools implement all this? Not necessarily. But now with the work in EYC, we're able to advocate for more of these policies to be put into place. And of course, to like LGBTQ inclusive curriculums and also empowering families and parents and legal guardians to be able to have the opportunity to learn about impacts our community. And if we can please move on to the next slide, Shire. And so one of the amazing cool works that we've been able to do under EYC is something called HEAT, and we're actually coming up on the second year of doing this. Um, it stands for our Healing, Education, and Art Transformation Programs. And so this is a summer program that is specifically for LGBTQ youth. It's, um, and so it's art policy, it's leadership development, and then also they get exposed to harm reduction education, whether that be in the context of like sexual health or substance use prevention. So as you can see in like one of the images, that's me in the blue. I'm showing like some of the youth in my program what to do in case of a fentanyl overdose. I'm not really familiar with the politics of other states right now, but I can speak that in California right now, um, fentanyl overdoses, especially here in LA, has like really been ravaging our communities. So it's very important for us to be equipped with the knowledge and the tools of like what to do during these situations. And even with myself, with like, my youth specifically, because like working with queer and trans youth is different. You know, like I think that for many of us, like say especially for my generation, like our first introduction to queer and trans spaces is usually like in nightlife. It's at the club. And there's no answer to it. Like, I think that the clubs do have, like, an important and sacred way of us to be able to be a part of intergenerational community. But, like, if you, that's their first exposure into our community, it's just, like, alcohol, like, drugs are being used. It's just, like, also not the safest space. So for us, it's, like, when presented with the opportunity for you to be able to party or go into this, it's, like, we just want to make sure that you're going to have the agency and ownership of what to do in any situation and so all these and then some of the pictures here like the youth they got to present their art projects and then we actually then had like a culmination exhibition and it was actually been able to recognize by district supervisor Hilda Solis smaller youth that's something they also like in addition to all the like personal and like um professional development that they got they also got something to put on the resume that they were recognized by like a high elected official and even though I'm critical of those systems in place, it just further substantiates that the only thing that separates our youth, youth of color, queer and trans youth from any other youth is just opportunity. That's really all it is. It's just having access to these spaces, um, to these spaces, excuse me. And can we please move on to the next slide? And so something also that's really dope, you know, just to like further illuminate a little bit of the stuff that I was talking about, where like oftentimes like queer and trans youth don't have access to just like spaces where they can be themselves, is that we are able to have like a queer prom, like and just an outlet for them to be. And I'm gonna I'm gonna skip because I want to be mindful of time and make sure my other peers present as well. So can we please skip this slide? Um, skip this slide as well. Um, our fierce and fearless poetry, y'all can skip. And this is the culmination I was talking about, but we can skip this slide. And so something just now that I want to end on is like now we're able to have a youth council here at Reach LA. So all these 10 amazing youth that you see here 
are actually now advocating for systems change within their schools on like how to have that inclusive sexual health education, how to empower the rights of like queer and trans students. And it's just so amazing for me to see because I can say that like for myself in high school, like I wasn't even out. So like now just to see these youth like going to trainings, making public comment at school board meetings are just like fiercely advocating for themselves. It's just like with everything going on in the world right now and you know, we're seeing just so many, like, harm and violence being caused to our community. It just, it gives me hope. And no, I know that, like, uh, we're in the right hands and we have nothing else but to win. And we can move on to the next slides because it's just further, it's just more pictures of our youth. So you can hit the next slide, please. So, yeah, uh, Natty, um, Arrow, and then, yeah, Julie, all our youth, all our youth are um, super amazing. But I do want to, um, and we're beyond deliverables. That's right. Like, even though we do HIV prevention work, we do a lot of sexual health, health services. We don't treat our clients in a clinical setting. Like we really take care of each other. And so that's everything for me on behalf of Rich LA. Um, I definitely love to pass it on to my peer, Natalie, so that she can also be able to share on her work. Natalie, I think you're on mute. What? <laughs> How about now? Am I on mute? Nope, I can hear you now. Okay, good. Um, restart time. Just kidding. <laughs> okay, hi, my name is Natalie. I'm the co-founder um, of the Auburn Hip Hop Congress and the West Coast Regional Director of Hip Hop Congress, which is an international nonprofit that focuses on hip hop arts, education, and social change. And I am just so honored to be here today with my peers, Native Dads Network, Reach LA. I'm representing Elevate Youth California. This program has just really, really changed a lot for the better, not only in our group, but in our community as well. Um, it has been so empowering and the lessons that we've learned have been priceless. And I'm gonna share a little bit of those today. Can we go to the next slide? So our, our project with Elevate Youth California started in January, 2020 with a group of young leaders who were looking at the education system and the mental health system because um, as you know, there's a lot of gaps, there's a lot of things that could be improved and they were experiencing some of these, um, some of these gaps. And so what we did is we first did some community mapping. So we looked not only at the resources available, but how did they play out? How did they work for people? Because a lot of times we say, hey, we have a resource, go get help. And then you find that people aren't eligible, they're really hard to access or just wasn't effective for them. And so we did this through, um, we did this through 33 video interviews. We, we interviewed students, parents, teachers, principals, police chiefs, mental health professionals, um, and, and just really got a comprehensive view of our community and and the universal gaps. So a lot of times it's the same things <laughs> that are causing problems. And unfortunately, some of the same things that were causing problems back when I was a young person. And so through through this project, so we've identified these universal gaps and um, we wanted to come up with some innovative but realistic solutions. And so one, one of the things one of the things we looked at was um, mental health crises and how our area handled those. So basically, if you needed help, um, you have police as your first responders. Uh, you will go to an emergency room for hours, sometimes days. 
and then sometimes end up in a psychiatric facility. Now you can imagine through that whole process, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And there's a lot of things that can go wrong when people are in their most vulnerable states and, and they need help. And so the young people that I work with came up with some ideas. Um, one of them was having a youth advisory board in the facilities. And so some, uh, a youth advisory board with lived experience that can advise on policy, hiring practices, and, and the things that made the situation sometimes more traumatic for the people who had to go through that. Another thing that we realized was it was really hard to navigate, even as an advocate, um, these systems and know who to talk to. For example, if you needed a patient's rights advocate, sometimes they're called ombudsperson, sometimes they're called patient's rights advocate, and sometimes they're called quality. And it's it was increasingly hard, even for myself as an advocate, to find that person. I got sent to a financial ombudsperson. And so we really think that an infographics for the names of who you talk to, for what in each system, because it's different in all of them. Another thing that we wanted to see, um, much like AA and NA groups are very accessible, um, a mental health kind of crisis youth support group that is just as ex ex accessible, I'm sorry, I'm trying to go fast. Um, anyway, the a group like that would be really beneficial. And of course, it's not going to meet all the needs of a mental health crisis, but it may mitigate and, you know, avoid a lot of the things that our youth were experiencing. And the final thing, which I think is the most important thing, was what do we do in the meantime? So we're here and we're trying to make changes in these systems. And we, we know that that sometimes is slow moving. What do you do in the meantime? What do you do when a young person doesn't have their counseling meeting for three weeks? Or, you know, what? how do we empower ourselves to navigate during those times? And we had a really unique and fortunate situation working with the licensed clinical social worker through the EYC um, funding where when the youth had something they wanted to work on, maybe it was boundaries, anger management, handling anxiety, substance use, whatever it was, um, she would design workshops and bring them in. And it was not only empowering for the young people as a facilitator, I learned more more than I have probably my whole education. I'm like boundaries, someone should have told me about this. And so um, that was very, very empowering. Can we move to the next slide? <laughs> and, and maybe move to the next slide again. <laughs> Okay, so, so I talked a lot about the mental health system and some of the ideas that we um, would like to see happen. Now on the schools, the education system, remember we started this project January, 2020. This is before COVID. So a lot of times we blame we blame a lot on, oh, COVID ruined it all, right? Well, our systems were perfect prior. And so, but what we didn't expect was what was to come in our um, school systems. And we, we didn't expect school board takeovers um, that caused distress to families and teachers. We didn't expect rigid agenda agendas countering the very things we're learning how to make spaces inclusive, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, social, emotional learning are under attack now in, in our community, at least. And I think across the United States, um, we didn't expect these elevated attacks on LGBTQ plus youth. Um, we didn't expect book bannings. We didn't expect groups trying to eradicate wellness in schools. Okay, we can move forward to the next one. But this also taught us so much um, that we will use to move forward. So the opportunities that this presented were to work with different groups of people. And we worked in a very grassroots way and we worked with, with our systems and our service providers. And we learned through that, that there, there's a big disconnect between the needs of the people and sometimes our systems designed to help people. And I think if we can kind of figure out, 
like what that discrepancy is, I think we can move towards more positive change. So for example, in a grassroots model, we are working with, we're not necessarily partnering with the schools in ways you would think. So we're partnering with the teachers and the families and the school counselors and school staff. And this looks like a people-centered model that's connected to the voices and the needs. Um, it's issue-based, it's volunteer-driven, people share ideas, diverse expertise is leveraged, and innovation is necessary. Easy pivots too. So when we see something wrong, we can try something, evaluate it, modify, and repeat process until we have things that are effective. Um, in an institutional system, and I want to be clear, I'm not talking about service providers, the humans. I'm talking about the systems. I think we kind of have to admit that our systems are broken, but the people don't have to be. The people is what where the hope is, right? So, but in institutional systems, they're bureaucracy centered, um, which automatically disconnects them from the people. Um, oftentimes it's funding driven, but because we need resources, right? But it kind of becomes something different when you have to kind of fight for that relevancy and the resources to do what you need to do. It's often political, slow to change and innovation resistant. So, so what do we do? What do we do? There, there's a model you see working has no resources, models that have resources that are struggling. And, and, and then you have the humans. <laughs> the humans is the answer in my opinion. So the bridge between these two, at least thus far, I think is teaching advocacy and education just around these different things, mental health education, health education, because that empowers us and our communities and our youth to not only understand ourselves better, but to help one another. Um, civic awareness and engagement is so important um, because I feel like we were blindsided. People weren't paying attention and they had no idea what was going to happen and how deeply it was going to affect them. And then one of, the, I think the most important things is human-centered collaborations. So unfortunately, sometimes between collaborations between organizations, something is lost. Um, sometimes partners don't feel valued. Sometimes staff are burnt out over, you know, they have too much of a caseload and they're not supported in the ways they need to be, which, which is rough because we are expected to help at risk and marginalized and youth and, you know, whatever the focus is of our organization. But if we are not okay, that, that makes it really hard. And so I think we really need to change the way we work together and find out, you know, what, what value we bring to the table, but also what makes us feel valued. And I think that can make a huge change. So we could go to the next slide. So for us, what we are doing um, is civic engagement of youth leaders and mentors. So we are, our youth are attending board meetings, speaking at board meetings, writing letters. They have speaking engagements for service providers, sharing their experiences and how the resources have worked or not worked for them and offering ongoing training and support. We're connecting and collaborating with every facet of our community. Um, we are also designing and implementing in-school programs that create inclusive spaces, encourage positive school environments, and meet social-emotional needs of the students. We can go to the next slide. So here, here's some of our civic engagement. I, I did say we had, we have, we're, we're having quite a battle in our town with school, school board trying to take away our diversity, equity, inclusion inclusion statement and, you know, just a lot of hasty, rigid decisions and refusal to listen to the community. We've lost two thirds of our teachers. So, um, you know, our community is coming together and our youth are coming together to try to make a difference in this. We can go to the next slide. <clears throat> um, this is an example of one of our in-school programs and also kind of a result of those hasty decisions of the board members. They they had to close the school and they chose the school that was 75% Latino population and a lower income part of town and that 
And so in the combining of the schools, there was increased bullying. And so they, you know, they called Hip Hop Congress, hey, <laughs> come help out. And so we, we had the opportunity for our young leaders to help develop and implement workshops for their fourth and fifth graders um, to learn important skills like how to create space when you need it, how to make friends, how to deal with conflict and how to work together. And we did all this through really fun activities, music, art, improv, drama, debate. <laughs> okay, we can go to the next program. <clears throat> I mean, the next slide. So ultimately what we want to see for our future, I know this looks like a lot of words, but they are all so important to us. Um, and I believe this is, this is the key to make um, a better future, but we need to be empowered through education and support. We need to be willing to be innovative. We need to not lose our compassion, um, critical thinking and, and big ideas. Like when I talked about service providers being separate from a broken system, what you see is you'll see people come with great ideas, people who are working in the trenches and they're seeing what's not working and, and, and they, when they speak up, they're not always listened to. And I, I want us to start listening. And I also want us to start speaking up ourselves. And um, I don't know if I ran out of time, but we could go to the last slide and I'll say thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalie. And I know that um, we kind of had a late start um, and I'm not sure. And I think that um, our panelists have been monitoring the chat. So I want to thank you for, for doing that and addressing any questions that have come through there. We want to thank um, each and every one of you for, for joining um, today's session. And we want to also share that we're happy to connect you with any of the panelists um, who um, joined today. So you can see um, the names of each of the panelists and then also our email and contact um, information. So again, we want to thank um, Stephanie for being here, uh, Victor, Natalie, Michael, and also Patricia, um, who's absent from this slide. But we want to thank um, Native Dads Network, um, Auburn Hip Hop Congress, Reach LA for sharing about their programs. And uh, also want to extend a thanks to the conference host um, for just hosting this wonderful opportunity for us to come together to learn from each other. Um, we extend our gratitude. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Thank you all so much for just sharing your time, your experience, and your expertise with us today. Um, thank you for just showing and telling us that as we as individuals were able to address some of the challenges we see in our community. I feel more empowered by attending this session, so I hope that the audience does as well. So thank you to our audience for attending this. Thank you for being here. Um, I do want to quickly reference one question that we have in the Q&A. Um, I think this is addressed to the Native Dads Network, so I'm going to show it real quick and then we can go ahead and wrap up. And so the question is, do you have any book recommendations to learn more about mental health or other helpful topics in relation to the indigenous populations? We serve many Cherokee families and I would love to be more informed. So I think Michael, if you're still here, that might be more addressed. We can't hear you if you're talking. And if not, Michael, if you can respond in the chat, that would also, oh, we hear you now. Go ahead. Um, there you go. <laughs> uh, we, I would just say if, if they would like to take our, I'll keep on my contact information um, in the in the chat and then they can contact me and I could ask that question. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, everyone. One second. Thank you again for joining us today. Our next session is going to start in about 20 minutes. And we'll hear from our keynote speakers, which is actually going to be a panel. And the panel's on juvenile justice and mental health. And they're going to focus on the intersection of juvenile justice and mental health, as well as exploring avenues for systemic change. Again, please go ahead and complete the feedback survey that is located on the reception page at the end of the day. Please enjoy this quick 20-minute break, and we'll see you hopefully at 3.30. Thank you again for joining us.